Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gajah Mada International Conference on Tropical Medicine 2022. Now we are heading to the Symposium 7 under the topic of Wolbachia Intervention. And this symposium will be moderated by Mrs. Egi Arguni, PhD from Universitas Gajah Mada. Here it is the profile of Mrs. Egi Arguni. She is very active in public health research projects focusing on dengue and immunology. She currently has multiple roles at Universitas Gajah Mada as a lecturer, researcher, and also currently a pediatric infectious disease consult at the Department of Child Health, Dr. Sarjito General Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health, and Nursing, Universitas Gajah Mada. She began her studies at Universitas Gajah Mada with a medical degree, then progressed to complete her PhD at the Graduate School of Medicine, Chiba University, Japan. She continued her studies at Universitas Gajah Mada in 2010 with a Master of Science to specialize and become a pediatrician. She has been the local lead scientist for 11 years on the World Mosquito Program Yogyakarta, which aims to protect the community from mosquito burn diseases through innovative methods and operations. She has published and authored numerous international journals with different research focuses. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give the time to our moderator, Mrs. Egi Arguni, PhD. Please, the time is yours. Thank you, um, Daeta, as a master of ceremony. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to be a moderator in this great session, Wolbachia Intervention. This session should be chaired by Dr. Tejo Sasmono, but we had sad news yesterday. Dr. Tejo, you have our deepest condolences for the loss of such a uh, wonderful mother. And now back to our session. This morning, we will have three outstanding speakers, Professor Ari Hoffman and Dr. Catherine Anders from Australia and Professor Adi Utarini from Indonesia. Our three speakers will give a talk, about 20 minutes each approximately, and then we will have about 15 to 20 minutes session for discussion. I invite all participants to give comments and questions. You may text your questions and comments in the Q&A chat box. And I believe all of our speakers we are very happy to discuss our, uh, your concern or your question. For the first speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Ari Hoffman. His current position is as Melbourne Laureate Professor, School of Biosciences, the University of Melbourne, and as a distinguished professor at Alborg University. He published thousands of papers, in the field of genetics, parasitology, and entomology. He was rewarded Companion of the Order of Australia, AC, for his outstanding achievement and service. Professor Ari will talk about Olbachia releases for disease control, a replacement, suppression, and something in between. Professor Ari, I believe now you are in uh, our session. The time is yours. Hi, my name is Ari Hoffman. I'm from the University of Melbourne in Australia. I'm presenting this talk on behalf of um, several other people in our group, the PhD group, including Tom Schmidt from the left to the right, Xin Yue Gu, Perrin Ross, and Chong Yang. So obviously, um, Orbachia doesn't really need much introduction to this audience here, given the success of Orbachia releases in Jogjakarta. Um, but just to remind you that a key aspect of Wolbachia releases is the fact that the Wolbachia can generate incompatibility when infected males, as indicated in the blue here, mate with uninfected male females, as indicated in the black. 
So infected times, uninfected um, is okay, the reverse cross is okay, but it's the one where you have an infected male mating with an uninfected female. That produces incompatibility. And this is really one of the one of the key components of the Wolbachia release strategy, um, as demonstrated in Drosophila many, many years ago. It actually allows for the spread of Wolbachia into a particular population. So, so the incompatibility you get with an uninfected female mates with an infected male and produces sterility is a key component of one of the strategies that we use um, for back here releases. And this was first tested in Guangzhou in China, in the village outside of Guangzhou. So we have the situation where we have a control site indicated by the blue and a release site indicated by the green. And in this case, we're just releasing males into the population of mosquitoes. So these are Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, um, which of course are a problem in some places with respect to the transmission of dengue and other viral diseases. So what happened is that after release has started, as indicated by this green line that you can see running across um, down, sorry, down running um, <laughs> down the graph, then effectively the green area gets less and less you get fewer and fewer mosquitoes in the green area and eventually down the end you effectively do not see any mosquitoes in the green treated area on the other hand if you look at the blue um, area then we still detect the mosquitoes happening so you can use that information to look at the um, efficiency of suppression of those mosquitoes and you can see that by the end of the release, it's actually close to 100%. I mean, it's not perfect. You do get these sorts of blips occurring. So you do get the reoccurrence of some mosquitoes. Um, but eventually, it does look like you can, through this particular approach, eliminate mosquitoes in a small population at least. But, you know, it does require continuous release of many, many males. Um, and those males gradually sterilize the entire female population. But of course, once you stop releasing, then eventually the mosquitoes come back so then the population builds up again. So this is a, a useful strategy. It's using war back in an interesting way. It's being applied in Singapore in particular in a very large scale. And it's also being applied in a smaller scale in some other places in the US and also in Europe. It can work. It's very intensive. It, of course, requires the sexing of the mosquitoes before you release them, which is challenging in its own way. And it's quite an expensive a process that requires continual releases. But, you know, it's certainly feasible to do that in some situations. Yeah, so as well as obviously causing incompatibility, which can be used in those releases where you actually um, release males to sterilize females. We know for a number of years now from a number of studies that Wolbachia also presses, suppresses the transmission of the dengue virus itself inside the mosquitoes when a mosquito feeds on a person with dengue and then of course um, transmits the dengue to another person. So a couple of examples from those sorts of studies of walker doll and Antidol. So in walker doll, obviously it's showing that the WML and WML pop strain are very low loads of dengue virus in the body and um, the Antidol shows that this AU strain is particularly low but there's also a reduction in this L B strain as well as the WML strain. So there's lots of data on this sort of thing these days. So the spread has been achieved in a number of different countries now. Um, here's an example from Malaysia. This is the WLB strain that's different to the one that was released in Jogjakarta, as I mentioned before. So we have a situation where there's two sites here and the dark gray area in the case of the period of release and the line, the blue line in the case of what happens to the wall back here frequency as monitored by different traps, these Rovi traps. And you can see that the frequency goes up and it basically stays up and it's been stable in that Mentari Corp population now for a number of years. If you look at the graph down the bottom, you can see that in this case, it's not quite a smooth sailing. You have this sort of bumpy ride at the beginning, but eventually it does become stable. The releases go for a longer period of time, um, but eventually we do end up in a situation where the Wolbachia does invade. And again, that population has been stable now for a number of years. 
So alongside that effect, you do get evidence of suppression of dengue. Um, this is some of the first evidence that we collected from Malaysia. Um, so we have a number of release sites, we have a number of match control sites. And the gray area indicates the um, incidence of dengue at those sites um, pre-release. And then the blue area indicates the post-release period. And as you can see in the release site post-release, you basically have a situation where the dengue is um, fairly much at a very, very low incidence in that site compared to the control sites where you're still getting these quite large outbreaks of dengue occurring. So that gives you some confidence that the thing is actually working in the field. And um, this approach has been operationalized in Malaysia now in a number of different contexts. So, of course, life isn't all simple. It's not a question of throwing your mosquitoes out and everything's absolutely fine. And we had the situation in Brazil um, many years ago with WML, where in the particular suburb of Rio to be a Kanga, the mosquitoes were released, the frequency of back here went up. So the red area here is the release period, frequency goes up, release was stopped, and then the um, WML crashed from the population. And in this particular case, what seems to have happened is that the, um, the insecticide resistance of the base population that was released was not particularly high. Of course, spraying goes on and continued um, during the release period and after release period. So as soon as you stop releasing, you've got these mosquitoes that have all back here, don't have resistance and they die when you spray pesticides. And as a consequence, you effectively um, lose the back here from that population. So in Malaysia, we've also had our, our share of problems and um, complexities along the way. So this is a blue line indicating our releases in a place called the PKNS Flats. So these are high rise flats um, in near Kuala Lumpur. And you can see that all back here, as indicated by the blue line, goes up. Um, we stopped releasing. You can see the end of this gray bar, but then it crashes down. But we continue to release intermittently. So you can see there's little gray blips. And, um, and then the frequency wall back here eventually took it, went up again. And um, funnily enough, the frequency wall back here now has been quite stable in a particular location. So quite unpredictable, um, but um, it eventually got there. So it doesn't always get there. Can be problems, can be a bit bumpy along the way. And of course, this makes us worry, right? Because I mean, what we want to do is. And we're trying to understand why sometimes the Wolbachi invades, why sometimes it doesn't invade, why sometimes it persists and doesn't persist. And, you know, it's just quite a complicated process. And I don't really want you to focus too much on the slide, but just to note that, you know, there are different components involved in terms of getting the spread in the first place. And then, of course, once you get the spread to keeping the spread um, happening and getting the um, wall back here, suppressing the disease. But then it's also there's a longer term issue of how stable it is across time, because of course you can get these evolutionary effects happening on the host, on the virus itself, and also on the wall back here, as indicated by those three arrows at the bottom. So this is a very simplified version of that slide that I just showed, which is just looking at those top sections. This is the one I want to focus on in this talk. Uh, so what we're really doing is looking at different components that contribute to the spread and the persistence of Wolbachia and, of course, potentially the disease effects as well. And the first thing to remember when you um, consider all of this is that, you know, Wolbachia has to overcome what we call an invasion point. So if you release, you know, a very low frequency of Wolbachia in a population, then despite that incompatibility mechanism, it actually can't spread in the population. And that's because we're back again affect the fitness of the host, of the mosquito host. So there are fitness consequences on the host of harboring these um, trans infections of Wolbachia, and they can actually be quite large. And um, that can lead to the failure of an introduction or the failure of an introduction to be stable across time. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, across the last few years, we've realized that this invasion point is much more complicated than what we used to think in the old days. So it's worth remembering, and I'm just, you know, I'm stepping out of the mosquito world here for a second, the Drosophila world, you know, WML, for instance, is a Wolbachia that was originally found in Drosophila malagasta. And if you look at the frequency of WML and natural populations of, of malagasta, it's actually quite complicated. So you find that in tropical areas, um, 
the WML is at quite high frequency. So if you look at the left hand side of this graph, you can see that it's actually present at quite a high frequency. You know, and this is just data from a couple of years from Australia, um, but we have similar data from other places. So in this particular fly, we have a high frequency towards the tropics. But by the time we go to temperate areas, we have quite a low frequency. So, so clearly, you know, there is an environmental component involved in the fitness of WML in this particular host um, that affects its ability to persist in this particular population. So, you know, so we know from previous work in natural hosts, in this case, Drosophila malagasta, that this is a, an issue. And if you look at WL, and, you know, we, we've studied costs associated with back here, and we realize that there's more than what we thought. Uh, so here's an example that was established a few years ago. And this is this issue of eggs that are in a, a state of, of quiescence, you know, a state of stasis. So when you've got a mosquito, the female lays the eggs, and often the water body then dries up, and the eggs have to persist in a dried state for quite a long period of time. Water comes along through rainfall or flushing out or something like that, and then the eggs hatch, and then you get your breeding cycle started. But it turns out that when you look at the survival of the eggs against time, then you find that the Wolbachia um, eggs don't do as well as the uninfected eggs. So this black line is the uninfected eggs. The green line is this W. Bell pop um, strain of Wolbachia inside the eggs, and it pretty much kills the eggs that are in this quiescent state. Um, the red line indicates what happens to another strand. This is LP, and again, you can see this drop off occurring across time. So, different Wolbachia strands show different rates of death um, during this state of stasis. WML is somewhere in between the black line and the red line. And this, of course, can mean that, you know, if the Wolbachia kills the eggs, then you have a situation where the Wolbachia will have trouble invading and also could disappear from the population. So as well as the eggs not hatching, we also have an issue of female fertility. These are the females that come out of those eggs that have been stored for a long time. So if you look at those blue lines, this is effectively what happens when you have a Wolbachia infection present in those eggs, the old bee infection. And you can see that eventually all the females become infertile. They lose fertility uh, once, even though they hatch, whereas WML and the uninfectors don't seem to be affected too much by this phenomenon. Now we've we've done various dissections to understand this, and basically it looks like the um, the Wolbachia stops the development of ovaries in females that hatch from eggs that have been stored for quite a while. On the left hand side we have a picture of a dissected ovary, um, sorry, dissected um, female reproductive system, and there's just no ovaries present. On the right hand side we have one from a normal female, uninfected female, you can see these things sticking out filled with eggs, and those are actually the sign of healthy ovaries from those females that again have hatched from these stored eggs, but in this case from an uninfected individual. So female fertility is a real issue. So we've also found quite large environmental effects on the stability of all back here in some situations. And this, again, is something that seems to vary from strain to strain. So here's one example of one of these experiments, which we did in 2017. So what you're looking at is a comparison of three strains, WML on the left, WLB on the middle, and WML pop on the right. And what we're doing here is we're rearing the mosquitoes under different cyclical temperatures, and, this, and they'll become increasing the as you go down. And this bottom one is 26 degrees to 37 degrees. And what we're then doing is mating the individuals together, so these are all infected individuals, uh, to see what impact it has on hatch proportions. And the point to really note is that, you know, this WML times WML cross, you can see that the hatch rate is shrinking very quickly, is decreasing very quickly under those hot temperatures, whereas the ones from the other strains are not really. So what you're effectively doing here is generating incompatibility within a strain. Um, so the Wolbachia has become incompatible, if you like, with itself. And that's because the temperature is causing the Wolbachia to fall out of this particular, um, in this particular infection. So that's a problem, because of course that could mean that you end up clearing some of the Wolbachia from natural populations. So we've done quite a lot of more work on this. And so, so we've done quite a lot of work on this issue uh, since we published the result back in 2017. 
we've compared different strains and different infections. So here's an example of the sort of work where we compare two genetic backgrounds, AU for Australia and MY for Malaysia. We're comparing combinations of nuclear and mitochondrial genes in these situations. So these are all, the black lines are all um, cured strains and the red lines are all infected strains, different infections from different sources. And, you know, the point I really want you to note is that uh, there is quite a large impact of genetic background on a lot of these sorts of traits. So if you look at this quiescent egg viability, it drops off much more sharply in one um, nuclear background than another nuclear background. And that just shows you that there's big effects that are separate from the actual Wolbachia. And then once the Wolbachia strains get involved, then, you know, you get these consistent drop-offs um, that seem to be independent of the nuclear background. So you do get, you know, it is quite a complex uh, situation where it does depend on the background of the population you're going into. You know, and that's why we always advocate that you back cross to the background where you're releasing very carefully when you're doing this sort of work. So we've also asked a question, well, you know, can we overcome these sorts of problems? So you've got um, the WML infection being more heat sensitive than LB. But is it possible to make WML more sensitive, uh, sorry, um, more resistant to heat? It may then be more suitable for um, hot temperatures. So we started doing um, microinjection experiments. We look at variability when we source the Wolbachia from different locations. So the original Wolbachia strain was sourced from a, um, a lab line, laboratory line, and we've actually sourced um, in this particular case, the WML will back here directly from a field population. So the idea is that in a field population that's experienced the hot temperatures, you may find that the will back is a bit different and it may be more resistant to heat. And um, that's exactly what you find. So if you look at these two comparisons, you can see that the original WML is quite different um, from a a genomic point of view to a new WML that we source from the field. So that's the first point. And the second point is you know, really this one here, that if you compare the WML, the old WML with the new WML, which we call WMLM, then you can see that um, those red bars, the WMLM, is actually um, better in terms of dealing with heat, in this case 29 to 39 or 26 to 38, you know, looking at different components. Um, so one's transmission and one's actually direct heat resistance. But you can see there's quite a big difference between these lines. And this WML M strain actually performs better in terms of tolerating um, heat and also in terms of not losing the wall back here infection under hot conditions during a transmission cycle. So, wall back is variable, you can select for it, and that's a good thing. So, you know, I've given you a quick rundown of the sort of work we've done, um, and um, we're really focusing on showing the effects of different things. You know, I don't have time to go into it all. But, but clearly, you know, the success of the Wolbachia um, can depend on the environment you're looking at. Uh, it also can depend on the host background. As I showed you very quickly, it depends on the actual variant, the Wolbachia variant you're looking at. Haven't really talked about operational issues, but are obviously critically important as well. And of course, also, they depend on the mosquito populations that you're looking at. So the spread of the Wolbachia depends on the different things, but importantly, they also affect the fitness effects that are caused by the Wolbachia. And, um, you know, as I said before, they can differ between populations and they are very, very important for your unstable point. So, you know, we have recommendations for releases um, starting in different countries based on the sort of information. And, um, and I think that can increase the um, chance of success of replacement. It can also have an impact on suppression. And of course, it's also worth remembering that these deleterious effects, these negative effects on fitness that I'm talking about, are very important in terms of keeping the population down even after replacement. So replacement is not simply replacement. Replacement is also the fact that you're often dealing with a smaller mosquito population after the replacement has finished. And that's where I'll leave it. And that's really it, I suppose, apart from thanking our funders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ari. That was a very comprehensive talk. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Anders. She earned her Doctor 
of philosophy degree from Monash University, Australia. And then, um, well, um, she ha already had the very um, various uh, publication, especially for the, um, not only for the World Mosquito Program and also other field. Uh, her current position is as director of the Impact Assessment World Mosquito Program at Monash University, Australia, and a young senior research fellow at the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Monash University. She will talk about the latest evidence from the World Mosquito Program. Kathy, you have the next 20 minutes. Thanks very much, Eggy. And I'll just check that you can hear me and see me. And can you see my slides? Yes. Can you see the presentation view of my slide? Yes. Very clear. Okay. Um, Thank I you. I already had and hopefully see the presentation. Sorry, Eggy, you can see the presentation in full screen. Yes. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Eggy, for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks very much to the conference organisers for the opportunity to speak to you today to give an update on um, the progress that our World Mosquito Program and its partners are making to deploy Wolbachia through um, communities at risk of dengue. Um, as Eggy said, um, my name is Katie Anders. I'm the Director of Impact Assessment at the World Mosquito Program. I'm based at Monash University in Melbourne. Um, so Ari and uh, other previous speakers have given us a good introduction to Wolbachia already, so I'll be able to go quickly through my first few slides. But just to highlight that um, WMP's Wolbachia method um, differs from the conventional approaches to dengue control and vector control and, and some um, Wolbachia-based methods that Ari mentioned just now, which aim to suppress the mosquito population, in that our method um, does not aim to reduce mosquito abundance. Instead, it uses Wolbachia to transform the mosquito population and to make it resistant to infection with dengue and other arboviruses. As others have mentioned, Wolbachia is a, an obligate intracellular insect bacterium. It occurs naturally in around half of all insects. And um, it's transmitted vertically from the parent, from the mother to her offspring via the insect's eggs. And because it exists naturally in so many species that we're exposed to every day, we can be quite confident that, it, that it's safe. Wolbachia has never been identified as a pathogen of humans, animals, or other vertebrates. But despite its prevalence in the insect population, um, Wolbachia doesn't occur naturally in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And the critical trait that makes it um, useful as an intervention against dengue and other medically imported arboviruses, or, or one of the critical traits, was the finding that when Wolbachia is transferred into Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, it makes them much more resistant to um, infection with and um, onwards transmission of dengue and other viruses, including Zika, chikungunya, and yellow fever. And so if um, Aedes aegypti can't become infected and the virus can't replicate effectively when it has Wolbachia inside the mosquito, then that mosquito is much less likely to transmit those viruses between humans. So introduction of Wolbachia into a mosquito population can therefore provide long-term and durable protection against dengue and other Aedes-borne diseases. Um, as Ari showed and Henrik mentioned in his previous talk, a second critical trait that Wolbachia confers on um, the mosquito, on insects, is um, cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is this mechanism um, that su supports its ability, um, facilitates its ability to spread itself through a mosquito population. And that means that when a Wolbachia-infected male mosquito mates uh, with a wild type female, as shown in the mating combination A here, her eggs are sterile and won't hatch. Whereas in these other two combinations, B 
and C, where a Wolbachia-infected female mates with either a Wolbachia-infected male or an uninfected wild-type male, her eggs will hatch as usual and all the progeny will carry Wolbachia. Um, and so that's how Wolbachia drives itself through an insect population. And what this means operationally is that short-term releases of Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes, males and females, over a period of months can lead to replacement of the wild-type mosquito population um, with Wolbachia-infected Aedes aegypti. And those Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes can be released um, either as um, eggs, as shown, sorry, either as adults, as shown in the top picture here, or as eggs where the mosquito eggs and some water and, and food are put in a, in a bucket or some sort of container and the, and the adults emerge over the next one to two weeks. Um, and so this, what this diagram shows here is that um, the, the dark blue um, mosquitoes are the wild type and this period of Wolbachia releases in the middle here um, can stop before uh, entire replacement of the mosquito wild type mosquito population occurs. And then through the process of cytoplasmic incompatibility, Wolbachia continues to drive itself um, into the population until nearly all mosquitoes carry Wolbachia. And this can take a, a year to 18 months or less in some places like Jogjakarta. And the important thing then is that Wolbachia stays in that mosquito population um, going forwards for years to come. Sorry. Next slide. Um, so World Mosquito Program is a not-for-profit limited company wholly owned by Monash University and is currently operating in three continents in um, Asia Pacific and um, Asia Pacific and Latin America. And since the first releases of uh, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in North Queensland more than 10 years ago, um, we've been deploying this intervention into now 11 countries. Um, in the Pacific, in Asia and in Latin America, and reaching an estimated um, population of more than 10 million people living in the communities where those uh, releases have occurred. Um, and the information I'd like to present to you in the rest of my talk today really speaks to three streams of evidence um, that have accumulated from these global releases to date and which are critical for accelerating further uptake of the Wolbachian method. And this is evidence that the method can be deployed at scale, um, that we're seeing reproducible evidence of public health benefits across the different geographies where Wolbachia has been released, and that um, um, economic evaluations in several settings have concluded that um, Wolbachia is likely to be highly cost-effective or even cost-saving um, when deployed into high-burden urban centres. So... The first sort of case study of deployment at scale is um, where many of you are sitting there in Jogjakarta in Indonesia. And I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we've got several speakers still to talk about the details of the Jogjakarta releases. But just to highlight that over a period of um, seven or more years, um, Wolbachia has been deployed throughout an increasing um, increasingly large population in Jogjakarta province, in Jogjakarta city, reaching an estimated 1.8 million people already across more than 500 square kilometres through sequential pilot releases and a quasi-experimental um, deployment, followed by a cluster randomised trial that ended in the middle of um, 2020. And since then, area-wide deployment throughout the um, remaining untreated areas in the city and expanding into um, Sleman and Bantul in Jogjakarta Special Region. These are egg releases and we're seeing um, self, as expected that Wolbachia is self-sustaining in the local mosquito population for already more than five years. Um, Brazil is another uh, country where um, WMP has been working um, since early days, so since 2015 um, through to 2022. Deployments um, have been done in um, now five cities, um, as shown on the map here, starting in Rio de Janeiro and, and Niteroi, um, and then expanding to uh, Belo Horizonte, uh, Campo Grande and Petrolina, and um, 2.7 million people um, are estimated to be living under Wolbachia coverage 
now in those five cities. Sorry, skipped. Um, in Brazil, uh, the releases have been mainly adults, um, in some cases with egg releases as well. And these are some pictures from um, Luciano Moreira, the PI of the Brazil project, showing their mass rearing and their release methods um, of bullback mosquitoes in Brazil. Um, I mentioned that one of the sites in Brazil was in Belo Horizonte. That is um, a location where a second randomized control trial is currently underway, um, being led um, out of the US from um, researchers at Emory and Yale in partnership with Luciano and his team in um, WMP Brazil. And um, I won't go into the details of that, but it's a slightly different design than what was used in Jogjakarta. There's 58 clusters. Um, half randomised one-to-one to receive Wolbachia releases or control as shown on the map here, but they are uh, school-based. It's enrolment of school-aged children. The clusters are based around school catchment areas and their endpoint is um, serological evidence of dengue infection um, from longitudinal uh, blood draws in those children over several years. Um, in Brazil, um, more recently, the um, monitoring in Rio and de Janeiro and in Niteroi and in the new sites has been led um, by local government. So they've moved to OV trapping rather than adult mosquito collections to sort of integrate with the activities of the uh, local vector control um, programs there. And as I'll mention later in um, the talk, that uh, public health benefits have been measured in Rio and Niteroi, and, and Henrik has already mentioned some of those. Um, the third place in which we've um, deployed at substantial scale, also in Latin America, is in Colombia. Again, between 2015 and 2022, with uh, staged releases starting in the Abura Valley and the continuous cities of Belo, Medellin and Itagui in the Abura Valley, and then over the last couple of years expanding to Cali, um, as shown on the map of Colombia there. Um, so around 4 million people um, in total are uh, living in these areas and the Abura Valley release sites are shown here with dark grey at the top is the municipality of Bejo, Bello, um, grey with the coloured green and yellow bits is Medellin and then Itagui in the south and this is really a continuous sort of metropolis in a valley um, with um, some quite high population density in the centre and then sparser populations and at quite high elevations as you go up the valley on the side of these cities. Um, this does represent the largest continuous um, po human population under Wolbachia releases with around 3 million people across these cities. And um, the coloured yellow and green areas here on the um, northeast of Medellin are where we conducted a, a case control study in one quadrant of Medellin in parallel with the citywide releases. And I'll mention that a bit later. Again, here in Colombia, that some of the stages of releases were adults and some were eggs. It was a mix. And um, excitingly, um, Cali is um, now serving as a a test case for um, automated aerial releases. So looking at, um, so Colombia has really been a site where we're looking at two extremes in a way of um, release methods. One being low cost egg release methods, similar to what's been done in, in Jogjakarta, but using egg capsule technology, highly reproducible, these sol soluble capsules filled with eggs and food can be popped in a bucket. Um, simple and affordable, but at the same time trialling um, sort of over uh, overground methods of releases from above where um, chilled mosquitoes are packed into a sort of release cartridge and then deployed using uh, a UAV or a drone um, over the city there. So those um, pilot releases are ongoing now in Cali. And then the final, sorry, not final, the fourth uh, site I'll mention um, for deployment at scale, the population is smaller, but this is still an example of a citywide release in New Caledonia in the Pacific, um, starting in 2019 with um, releases into the capital city, Numia. This graph here shows uh, that those releases um, with the Wolbachia introgression line in green um, through a period first of adult releases and then supplemented with egg releases and achieving 80% um, and since then higher um, 
stable at 80% and above in Numia and then expanded to the neighbouring municipalities in Greater Numia um, starting in 2022 and finishing next year, as shown on the map here, the adjacent municipalities of Montdor and Dumbaya to really um, fill out all of Greater Numia with Wolbachia. And I should mention that that's, um, that project there is being uh, led by a sort of triumvirate of partners with the, the city of um, Numia and the New Caledonia government, as well as with funding from the French government and the Institute Pasteur in Numia. And then to mention Australia, which um, Northern Australia, where uh, the first open releases of Bulbachia were done um, more than 10 years ago now in two outer suburbs of Cairns. Um, which were then followed by staged releases over the following six years across all of the previously dengue-prone areas, areas of North Queensland, including um, down to Charters Towers and Townsville in the south, up to Port Douglas and all up in the Northern Peninsula area in the north, um, and increasingly done by um, Queensland Health after the initial partnership with um, WMP. And... Um, these two publications shown here, one from um, our group and, and one from Ari's group, that have gone back in and collected um, mosquitoes from those earliest release areas up to 10 years post-release, showing that uh, Wolbachia is self-sustaining at a high level in that mosquito population a decade later, and that um, the virus blocking properties of um, Wolbachia and those mosquitoes have been maintained and the Wolbachia genome was highly stable over time in the field population. Um, we work with Queensland Health to use the um, communicable disease surveillance data to monitor um, dengue uh, cases, local dengue cases and imported cases um, over time in the release areas. And this has really shown um, that these, in these areas where Wolbachia has been deployed, they've seen really effective elimination of local dengue transmission in North Queensland compared to the historical period where importations of dengue in return travellers from endemic areas would lead to local outbreaks, sometimes quite large outbreaks. Um, and since Wolbachia deployment, they still have those importations until the borders closed for COVID um, and they've recently reopened. Um, but they're not seeing that spark lead to those local outbreaks of um, local dengue cases in those areas of North Queensland. And this is the Director of Public Health um, at the Tropical Health Services in Cairns, who really um, speaks to that uh, public health impact they've seen in Cairns, in Northern Queensland. So the next sort of stream of evidence I wanted to um, mention was around the reproducibility of the public health outcomes that we're seeing in these release sites. So you'll all be very familiar with the, the randomised controlled trial that was done in Job Jakarta between 2017 and, and 2020. Um, that shows the study site there. It was um, very successful in showing um, a large and significant reduction not only in overall dengue incidents, but an even bigger reduction in dengue hospitalizations in the Wolbachia treated areas. And those results were published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and Adi and others may speak to those results in more detail afterwards. Um, but what, what's um, really exciting is that even though we're not um, conducting randomized trials in other locations and we're measuring um, the impact of Wolbachia releases using routinely available disease surveillance data and looking at time series before and after Wolbachia deployment, we're seeing... So this is back to the Abura Valley, these three cities, Beijo, Medellin and Itagui, um, that are, have been released in a staged fashion. The light blue shows um, the accumulating area where Wolbachia deployments had started and the dark blue is the accumulating area in kilometre squared where um, Wolbachia had reached at least 60% prevalence in the mosquito population and stayed, not dropped back down afterwards. So the takeaway from Medellin is that only sort of half of the city has um, reached above that level. There's still some... Um, areas where the Wolbachia trajectory is, you know, it hasn't dropped out, but it hasn't got above 60% yet. In Beijo, um, the whole city is covered at a high level and in Itagui, 
But um, from the public health surveillance data, we're seeing um, in that post Wolbachia period um, a really marked reduction in dengue incidents compared to the historical period, with the caveat that dengue epidemics were um, more, much more sporadic even historically in these locations than in somewhere like Jogdakata. Um, but it's a large measurable reduction. Dengue cases in these cities were lower in 2021 and 2020 than any of the previous 20 years. And a parallel case control study that I mentioned on the map earlier um, supports a causal association between the Wolbachia deployments and reduced dengue because even in this context of very low dengue overall, we saw um, a 50% lower dengue in the three neighbourhoods where Wolbachia was released early compared to three neighbourhoods that remained untreated throughout the case control study. Um, Brazil, uh, where we also rely on the disease surveillance data, Henrik spoke to these results earlier, so I'll just touch on them quickly. But the takeaway here is really that even where Wolbachia is um, still at variable levels in the mosquito population, we're still seeing measurable reductions in um, dengue and chikungunya incidents. And in Niteroi, the neighbouring municipality in um, to Rio, we uh, measured a um, significant reductions in dengue as well as um, chikungunya and a more marginal um, reduction in Zika in the Wolbachia treated areas compared to part of Niteroi where Wolbachia releases weren't done. Um, so the, this graph rep um, really represents these measured reductions across all of our release sites where the circles are those point estimates of reduction and, and the bars are confidence intervals. And the takeaway here is that we're really seeing reproducible impact. All of these um, uh, estimates and their confidence intervals are to the left of that line that represents no change, um, despite differences in the way um, public health impact was measured and the duration since the end of releases. Um, as Raman mentioned earlier, in late 2020, we submitted these, this portfolio of data to um, the WHO's Vector Control Advisory Group. Um, and in their meeting report after that, they concluded that um, based on the evidence provided, there is um, public health evidence of public health value of Wolbachia against dengue. And, Wolba and WHO is currently coordinating a, a guideline development process, and we, we hope that will be forthcoming very soon. I realise I'm short on time. So I've just got a couple more slides to finish up. Um, I just wanted to mention the cost effectiveness um, aspect quickly in this one slide. Um, I know it's a busy slide, but an important factor, obviously, in scaling up this intervention is the affordability and the cost effectiveness of the method. And over the past few years, we've commissioned um, external health economists to do economic evaluations um, of scenarios of large scale programmatic deployment of Wolbachia into priority markets, including Indonesia, Colombia, and Vietnam. And the high level results of those studies are summarized on these slides. And the takeaway messages are that um, targeted delivery of Wolbachia to priority cities where there's a high dengue burden and a high population density can um, lead to a have, a have a substantial impact on the overall national dengue burden by targeted by targeted releases and that because the economic burden of dengue is high in these cities and in these countries even assuming and these studies all assumed um, as sort of con reasonably conservatively that Wolbachia would reduce dengue by 75 percent um, even then that um, produces large economic benefits through savings in healthcare costs and in, and in broader societal costs of increased um, productivity and reduced um, time off work and school. In Indonesia, the upfront costs of implementing Wolbachia were predicted to be recouped two to three times over within 10 years through these savings in medical costs and lost productivity. And in Colombia, the intervention was predicted to pay for itself with, sorry, within five to 10 years, um, even just considering the savings in healthcare costs. Um, so just to mention in my last um, minute, um, some challenges that we see for the future of um, continuing to uh, scale up Wolbachia worldwide. Um, there's still this um, balancing the competing priorities of building additional evidence at the same time as um, moving to programmatic implementation. 
Uh, we need to industrialise mosquito production and the supply chain to continue to measure um, the durability of Wolbachia in the population and the long-term um, durability of the public health impact to understand generalizability of the method across different ecological settings and to reduce implementation costs and to demonstrate cost effectiveness and cost benefit across different settings and obviously to navigate um, country entry and regulatory pathways for scale up. In summary, um, I hope these, um, these results have showed that uh, Wolbachia has been successfully implemented at increasing scale over the past 10 years reaching more than 10 million people in total, with several countries um, deploying across uh, areas of more than a million people. Um, the reproducible public health um, evidence is leading WHO to develop a policy recommendation. Um, and we see that the intervention is you know, um, not just efficacious, but self-sustaining and resilient and equitable, as well as being highly cost-effective. It doesn't require long-term behaviour change. And we're sort of challenging um, people to think of this more as a public health infrastructure than a traditional vector control intervention where you've got upfront costs and effort, but then you have sustained benefits. And just to acknowledge here um, all the many um, partners that are involved in this work and our, the very generous support from our funders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. That was a very interesting talk. Please stay with us for Q&A session later. Also, uh, for Professor Ari, please stay with us. Our last speaker is uh, Prof. Adi Otarini. She published more than 60 papers in international journals with focus on infectious disease, control management, and surface quality management. Prof. Adi Utarini's current position is as Project Leader World Mosquito Program, Yogyakarta, from 2013 to present. She was rewarded Habibi Award for Medicine and Biotechnology in 2019 uh, and as 10 people who helped shape science in the 2020 Nature version, and also rewarded inspiring Women 2021 from Forbes Indonesia. Now she will talk about World Mosquito Program Yogyakarta updates. Ibu, the time is yours. Thank you to the organizer. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you. Um, I'm happy to share the updates from the World Mosquito Program in Yogyakarta, entitled From Research to a National Evidence-Based Policy. And this work is a collaboration between Universitas Gajah Mada, a World Mosquito Program, Monash University, and supported by the Tahia Foundation. Right, next slide, please. Yeah, so I will uh, start with uh, a little bit about the city, Yogyakarta City, uh, and the project, and then phases of the project with the key findings uh, from each of the phases. And then uh, implementation in two other districts uh, surrounding Yogyakarta City, and uh, finally road to a national evidence-based policy. Yeah, this is uh, this is Yogyakarta. Um, just to give you a bit of the taste of the city, and we enjoyed having having quite a, a good uh, high educational level of the people and also good health status, um, relatively well uh, society. But like other major cities, uh, I think despite all the, uh, the good things that we enjoyed, the city also uh, suffered from, from dengue. Um, 
So uh, I think in, in this graph that you showed um, at the national level, um, all the efforts, uh, great efforts made by the government, um, um, despite the long efforts, I think it, it really reflects that the challenges are much greater than all the efforts that, that uh, the government uh, tried. So dengue is still a major public health problem with nearly all uh, districts in this country reporting dengue cases. Yeah, so uh, this is the overall uh, phases of the project. We started in 2011, and then the first two years uh, of the project is for the preparation, feasibility. Uh, we thank Monash University for increasing our capacity of the team and then building the facilities, uh, and also started, uh, started uh, the entomology lab in, in Yogyakarta. Um, and then the next two years, we started with uh, releasing in the small scale areas uh, two uh, hamlets in Sleman and in Pandol districts. And this was done 2014. Uh, before we are then uh, entering the larger uh, release in Yogyakarta City, uh, we call this phase three, where we are allowed to uh, conduct the study of the impact to what extent that this technology really uh, can really reduce dengue. So from 2016 to 2020, 2020, this is when we uh, did the uh, impact study. And then you've, you've heard from the previous speakers also that it ended up with 77% with, uh, efficacy um, comparing the intervention and the control areas. So having all that uh, evidence, we then continued with releasing in the control areas. And then in addition, we implemented this technology in two other districts uh, adjacent to the Yogyakarta city. Yeah, uh, uh, phase one, just briefly, um, this is how, how we started. We had the multidisciplinary team. Um, and then we uh, also have to learn about all the existing regulations, how to build the entomology lab. Uh, at the same time, we look for uh, potential areas within the uh, Yogyakarta city and the province, um, engage, uh, build interactions with the community and also with the stakeholders. And at that time, we were not uh, thinking about the media engagement as we are still very early uh, in our phase. Um, and this, uh, it, it, during this phase, uh, our moderator for today, Dr. Aggie, uh, chaired this uh, early years of, of World Bank Air Technology. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, the next two years, then, we, we have to learn how to release. And we started with the adult release. The, what you saw in the video is what we ended up now by doing fully the egg uh, release. And that, that uh, shows you how, how we did it in the, in the community, yeah? using that uh, small container. And then we, we put it in the, uh, in the homeowners. Um, we release in still small scale, 10,000 populations, uh, and because it's research, uh, we were guided by the ethical committee uh, asking for individual consent up to then the community level consent. Um, we, we learn how to solve problems in the community uh, with the stakeholders and also at the same time how to respect the community, but also meeting the uh, requirements to do the study. So uh, that was the phase two. And then I think our important lesson was that uh, we, we learned that Bulbahia is uh, sustainable, can be established, can be established. And then uh, monitoring of Bulbahia frequency up to now showed that uh, the intervention is, is sustainable. However, we, we have not been able to show what's the impact in dengue reductions during that phase because it was uh, conducted still in a very uh, small limited areas. 
Yeah, you will see more of this in the next speakers. But just to quickly show that the, the trend of the Wolbachia frequency in the four sites during phase two uh, is good. The trend is very positive and it's uh, stable up to now in the four sites. Next. Yeah, so uh, be before we moved on to the large uh, scale release uh, prior to the impact study, um, we, we have to sort it out how to get the approval from the community. Um, during phase two, we started with individual consent, and this was uh, quite a work, even though it was still possible at that time because of the scale of the project. But as we entered to the larger, um, larger areas, um, that, that became uh, impossible to do individual consent and perhaps also unnecessary because uh, what, we, what we actually need is more of the community uh, approval towards this uh, intervention, which is also work at the, at the uh, communal level. So that, that slide showed the, uh, how we started in the beginning and also how we moved into more of a collective consent at the, at the a higher community level, which we called um, at the uh, at the village level. Yeah, and the same is also we, we need to build a better understanding also about the mosquitoes itself, uh, specifically the Aedes aegypti. And by uh, quite an intensive uh, trapping of the mosquitoes with the BG trap from 2015, uh, up to 2019, then we learned that uh, we always live with uh, Addis Aegypti mosquitoes around us. It is uh, always there, and it's just that in, during the uh, rainy seasons, then you could see that there are several peaks of, of Addis Aegypti population. So um, having to understand this, uh, then we uh, move to phase three. Uh, which is the impact study. Yeah, um, yeah, th th this, this uh, also in terms of the community engagement, yeah, what, what we learned was that uh, when we started, it was more of piggybacking to, to any existing uh, community meetings uh, because we are still working with the limited uh, areas. But as now we are working with the much larger areas, then we, we need a different strategy of involving a public campaign, mass media, social medias, and, and different strategies. Yeah, so with that, uh, and then also there was a, a risk analysis uh, done independently by, by a, a group. This was initiated by the Ministry of Research and Technology, which um, concluded that that this technology is uh, safe, the risk of uh, introducing harm is negligible, then we, con then we uh, entered this uh, phase, the impact study. Um, the areas of Yogyakarta city was divided into two. You can see the blue color top, uh, top left and the gray area bottom to the right. And this is the quasi-experimental uh, study using controlled interrupted time series design. Um, uh, where the blue areas, this is the intervention areas, and the gray areas becomes the control areas. And for this quasi-experimental study, we use the dengue data from the existing surveillance uh, system in the, in the uh, district health office. Yeah? So we, uh, which relied on the uh, Tengi hemorrhagic fever reported uh, by the hospitals. While in the, in the middle areas uh, in yellow, uh, these are the areas for the trial, uh, the AWET trial, application of Wolbachia to eliminate Tengi, where I think you uh, saw also from Cathy's presentation. So uh, we have two studies um, undertaken in, in parallel. One is the quasi-experimental study comparing the blue areas and the gray areas as control. And then within that we have the, uh, in the middle we have the uh, trial uh, going on. Yeah, um, so uh, 
Let me show you the results uh, first from the quasi-experimental study. Um, again, this is using the existing surveillance data in the district health office. Uh, we plotted from 2006 up to uh, end of 2020, where you see the blue line, solid blue line. This is the intervention. Uh, this is the uh, incidence uh, in the intervention areas, while the gray uh, line, this is the incidence in the control areas. And as, as you can see that from 2006 to uh, before 2017, I think the patterns of incidents in those areas are quite overlapped to each other. They are quite uh, comparable um, before the intervention started. Um, the intervention started in 2016, where we deployed Wolbachia into the blue areas uh, you saw on the, on the corner. And then um, after its establishment of about six, seven months uh, after the release, then you could see a very different pattern of the incidence of uh, dengue in the intervention areas. Uh, the dengue has been significantly reduced, yeah? It still fluctuates, but to a very, very low level, while in the control areas, the, the pattern is still relatively similar to the pattern, 10 years pattern uh, before. So this is our first evidence showing, I think the reduction was 79.5% uh, reduction in the intervention areas compared to the control areas. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, yeah, this is uh, on the on the left uh, corner. This is again in the uh, intervention areas where I just mentioned that we started releasing Wolbachia in two thousand sixteen, and then uh, below on the bottom left, uh, you saw that. Uh, we started releasing in the control areas uh, in, in 2020. Yeah? 2020. Um, so uh, overall, if we look at the whole uh, pattern, uh, the one on the right uh, side, um, overall the reduction is 79.5% uh, reduction. Next. Yeah, so that, that was the story of the quasi-experimental study. And then uh, along with the study, we also started the trial, the cluster randomized control trial study. And uh, there are several um, features which we think it's, it's unique and it's innovative. The, the first one is the public randomization that we needed to do. Because obviously, we, it's, uh, it's nearly impossible to blind the intervention. So what we did was we invited the local leaders from each of the areas, but also um, leaders of the city of Yogyakarta was also present to make sure that the process of um, randomizing the intervention and the control is, is done clearly is fair and it's uh, nothing can change that uh, the result of the public randomization. Uh, next, please. So that is the result uh, of the randomization. Uh, we have 24 areas, 24 clusters, 12 into the intervention areas and 12 into the control areas. Um, and for the dengue cases, this is now a virologically confirmed dengue cases recruited from eligible patients at the community health centers. Um, and yeah, uh, we have the, the results published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I think you've heard repeatedly that uh, we have 77% uh, reduction of dengue. Yeah, so for all virologically confirmed uh, cases of dengue, uh, again, the reduction was 77.1%. Uh, and uh, this works in all the serotypes of dengue. Um, but I think at that time, uh, a more, even a more uh, interesting result, which, which was the secondary uh, impact that we measured in this study was if you look at the hospitalization 
uh, of the VCDs, where the reduction was even greater, 86.2% uh, reduction of hospitalized um, cases due to dengue compared to the control. And certainly this, this also gives um, not, just, not just the epidemiological impact, but also the, from the economic point of view, this is uh, very important. Next. Yeah. So uh, in, in all, uh, if, if we now look at the Yogyakarta city uh, as a whole, then what we could see was that uh, you could see the patterns of the 10 years in Yogyakarta city. Um, and then we started, as we started the, in, uh, the intervention in 2016 uh, with the quasi-experimental study design and then followed by the uh, trial design, um, you could see that um, uh, now um, now we have 100% uh, areas covered, but uh, also when the all areas covered, you could see that the dengue cases has e even uh, lower uh, in the city of Yogyakarta, and we hope that this pattern will will continue, yeah, will continue and even uh, lower in the future. So this is in overall the summary of the Yogyakarta city after the two studies uh, undertaken in this study. Yeah, so uh, with, with that, that result, um, now we are, we are thinking of what, what's next uh, beyond the research. Um, Yogyakarta city, if we put it in that uh, map, it looks like this is a, well, it's small area surrounded by much larger areas with, with higher uh, dengue incidence. So, um, we, we need to think about how to best implement uh, this uh, without being, how do you say, being caught in the research mode uh, all the time. So in this case, we then tried to work collaboratively with the district health office, uh, working with uh, in each area, Sleman and Pantul districts, and we uh, work out how to integrate better with the existing dengue control uh, program. Next, please. Yeah, the areas are much larger, as you could see. Uh, now, we re the release area in Sleman, I think it's uh, nearly double with the release area in Yogyakarta. And also, uh, Bantol is also a uh, larger release uh, areas uh, with uh, about 20,000 number of, of buckets. And in both areas, we work with uh, particularly the women health uh, caters, about around 3,000 women uh, caters in each area, uh, assist helping to doing the, doing the release in each area. And also in some part of Pantol, we also try to uh, work together with an NGO yeah, in the area. So this will... Uh, enrich, I think, the experience of how to implement this uh, Wolbachia intervention in the area. Yeah, uh, I think if we look at the uh, latest result, I think uh, it's progressing very well. Uh, the latest monitoring in Sleman and Bantol areas, Wolbachia is beyond 70%. 70 so I think we are uh, in in good in good situation, and from our experience before, uh, we hope that this will also continue to, to to be stable in the in the area. Yeah, uh, in, in my last part of the presentation, this is more on uh, uh, on the additional work that uh, that we did in parallel uh, with the studies and this is um, working together with the, collaboratively with the ministry of health where we then have the opportunity to share the knowledge and the experiences with uh, eight other districts in indonesia and this was supported by the islamic development bank so you could see that uh, these are the areas in Indonesia and they were selected based on there were two separate studies undertaken by other groups uh, looking at different variables, socioeconomic variables, governance, but also the dengue control uh, program variables. And from there, uh, we selected these, these areas. 
and and then these areas was um, four of these areas was proposed uh, to the Ministry of Health as the potential areas for future uh, future implementation of Olbachia technology. Next, please. Uh, in line with that, uh, University of Gajah Mada has been asked to facilitate also the first national uh, strategy for dengue control program, 2021 to 2025, uh, where actually Wolbachia intervention has been uh, part of, of this national strategy. And two other documents are also uh, in, in draft at the moment. Uh, they are hoping to finalize this uh, roadmap to Wolbachia technology implementation scale up and uh, another document on the technical guidance to implement Wolbachia. Yeah, uh, towards the end, I think we are, we, are, we are very relieved that all the evidence that we uh, found from the research is uh, taken up by the Ministry of Health, uh, where he is uh, fully supportive of, of the project and very enthusiastic to continue with the, how, to, uh, how to spread in other cities in, in Indonesia. Next, please. Yeah, in, in summary, uh, first, I'd like to highlight that, um, yeah, we have uh, produced this evidence uh, and also in, in, in supportive with, with all the evidence from other countries. Um, very good efficacy, 77%, 86% uh, of hospitalizations uh, reduced. And also a, a, a newer coming evidence is that uh, fogging was also reduced to so about 87% in the intervention areas. Um, the intervention is now scaled up within the Yogyakarta province to two other districts and this is uh, um, uh, implemented using different strategy, collaborative uh, strategy, uh, but we realize that the successful implementation at the district level also requires good training uh, at different levels, uh, technical support and certainly quality assurance. Um, with continuous effort uh, and also pol policy dialogue, uh, this study has been, has been uh, taken up by the Ministry of Health and we believe the next step is for the Ministry of Health to lead uh, this scaling up in order to protect more Indonesian people from dengue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bu. That was a very interesting and uh, yet yeah, inspiring talk. Now we come to the discussion session. Um, we have several questions from audience. Uh, let me check it. Okay. Um, can we have uh, Prof. Professor Ari, Dr. Kathy, and Professor Adi Utarini? together in, uh, yep, very nice. I cannot see Professor Ari here. You can't see me. <laughs> hmm, sorry. Hi, Ari. Sorry. Hey, again. So you can, Hi. sorry, did you say, <laughs> sorry, did you say you can't see me or you can see me? Um, uh, wait a minute, uh, while the committee will... Um... No, we couldn't see. Okay. <laughs> yes, nice. Thank you. Uh, uh, first question, I think, um, uh, this one. Is there any difference of efficacy in lowering uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever incidence between releasing adult and egg? Thank you, Dr. Siakon. Uh, you already uh, answered this um, as the private answer, but uh, Dr. Siakon said that logis logistically a lot more simpler if you're using eggs, right? Um, Kathy, do you have um, any comments about this question? Yes, sure. Thanks, um, Dr. Eggy, and thanks, um, Siakon, for the question. Um, so we haven't, um, 
I don't, I think the question is about um, how well in different ecological settings we can get Wolbachia to introgress into mosquito population with the two different methods. In terms of the public health benefits, um, what we're seeing is that once Wolbachia is established at an intermediate to high level, we're seeing those re reproducible public health benefits regardless of what the method of release was. The challenge is um, in different settings how well eggs versus adults work. And, and eggs, as you say, have the benefit of being logistically much simpler, cheaper, um, you know, you can get into hard-to-reach areas that don't require road access, um, that um, vehicle deployments of adults um, need. But we are finding in some settings um, a downside of eggs is that uh, the mosquitoes are not um, surviving as well. There's fitness issues that they, they may not emerge. We have issues with predators interfering with the mosquito release containers, eating up the larvae before they have a chance to release. Also that um, those uh, water holding containers um, that the mosquitoes need to emerge from can be subject to um, heat effects if they're not sitting in shaded areas, which can compromise you know, the development of the larvae and the emergence of adult mosquitoes. So it's something which we're really looking at both options and it might be a setting specific question as to what's the mo most appropriate release method in different locations. We have seen establishment from both adults and eggs though, and we have seen public health benefits in both of those settings once um, Wolbachia has um, established. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Um, uh, next. Can I, can I sure. just give a very short uh, comment on that? Yeah. I think there's also another variable that we learn from phase two, which is from the uh, viewpoint of the community's acceptance. Yes. Um, I think we learned that with the egg uh, release is much more uh, acceptable by the community. So in addition to all the uh, variables that have been mentioned by Dr. Shakon yes. and also by Cathy. So I think uh, this is also one important variable to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I, would thank totally, you. I would totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, yeah, we, me sometimes, we, sometimes, we sometimes release eggs, we sometimes release adults. It uh, depends entirely on the community. And of course, when you release eggs, you have to have people hosting the egg container, and that can be a problem. In some communities, we'd rather just see releases happen very quickly from adults. So, and I think the other the other thing that's worth considering, which I'd add to um, to these comments, which which I totally agree with, are that of course it also depends on eventually when you go to delivery of um, the mosquitoes through, for instance, drones. That's also going to dictate the nature of what you're releasing. And certainly in a lot of developments that are happening in that area, it's the adults that, that make a much easier release target. So. Yes, thank you. Uh, awesome, um, of Abby. Um, about question, uh, you already answered in the Q&A. Uh, I will move to uh, live uh, question um, to, to you, uh, Professor Ari about the question, are there any genetic constraints between vertebra and invertebrate hosts which might be adapted by dengue viruses in order to interrupt the effectiveness of Wolbachia, which is transmitted by Aedes aegypti? Would you please um, uh, comment about this question? Yeah, I found this question a little bit confusing. Um, I wasn't quite sure what it was actually asking in terms of genetic constraints. Um, I mean, you know, of course, we have a situation where um, different dengue serotypes may um, affect the nature of the transmission blockage. You know, at this stage, we're pretty pop we're pretty confident that all the serotypes can be blocked by the Wolbachia, um, and that's good. But of course, potentially, you have a situation where um, you do have virus strains that are going to be harder to block and that of course could evolve over time and it's something you have to actually monitor in time. So that could, it's, it's a fact that it could affect the um, effectiveness of the Wolbachia strategy. We don't think that those sorts of things are going to happen very quickly because when you look at the mechanisms involved in the virus blocking, then it looks like there's multiple mechanisms. It's not just one mechanism and that actually means that the Wolbachia strategy in terms of the virus blockage 
it's much more likely to be stable than if you had a single mechanism that could be overcome by the dinghy. But I think it's, you know, it's, but a long-term effect of this, I think it's something that we have to keep monitoring. So at this stage, it looks good, you know, and as Katie indicated in her talk, we're having stability at the moment of the virus blocking, um, but it's, it's just something that we need to keep monitoring. I think it's critically important and particularly monitoring locally because of course, you know, what's happening in Yogyakarta may be different to what's happening in Kuala Lumpur, it may be different to what's happening in Colombia or Brazil. And it also depends on the nature of the Wabakia strain that you're releasing. Don't forget also that we have a lot of Wabakia strains potentially available. So if one fails, we can always start releasing another one. And um, that's one of the nice things about Wabakia, you can't have a fallback position. Okay. Uh, if I you. could just add... Sorry, Nikki, if I could just add, um, one of my colleagues, Kat Edinburgh, has a talk in the next session where I think she might be addressing some of those questions. She's doing work on passaging dengue virus and through Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes and, and trying in the lab seeing um, if there can be evolution of resistance to Wolbachia. So the next session might help to answer that question too. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, continuing the next question, I think it is... Um, also to uh, Prof. Ali, how long will the Wolbachia be sustainable in the community? Is there a possibility for need of release as the Wolbachia number decrease in the future? Yes, I mean, at the moment it looks, it's not just the number, but it's also the density of Wolbachia, right? That's the other potential thing we've got to watch out. So it's possible that Wolbachia density will also go down and might the, um, mean that you're facing a situation where they might be less effective in terms of blocking the transmission. At this stage, we're seeing remarkable stability. Um, at the, of course, the advantage of Wolbachia is that there's a bounce back built into the Wolbachia because, you know, if the frequency goes down for some reason, because of the incompatibility, that mechanism, it pushes back up again. <laughs> so if the frequency of Wolbachia dropped down to 60%, then of course, you know, you would expect the Wolbachia to climb back up again if initially it was sitting at 80% or so. And of course, you know, as both um, Dr. Addy and, and Katie emphasized, we've got a situation where um, even at 60%, you're still getting positive effects from the Wolbachia rising. So at this stage, I think, you know, it looks stable. At this stage, of course, we have situations where natural Wolbachia infections are stable for thousands of years. So <laughs> and it's a good, there's a good chance it'll be stable for a very long time. Um, but, you know, it's also possible that uh, for some environmental reason, um, you might get that effect. Um, I think one of the challenges, for instance, that might be one of the major ones that affect it eventually might be antibiotics in the environment. You know, if they build up to a certain level, then you can get some instability because it clears the Wolbachia out. I mean, I think beyond that, I would suggest that Wolbachia is going to be pretty stable. Yes. Thank you, Afi. Um, next question um, to uh, Professor Adi Utarini. Uh, well, Bakia technology is a good innovation in controlling dengue. Will this technology implemented in high dengue cases areas uh, outside Yogyakarta? Yeah, you already uh, mentioned about this uh, planning, uh, Prof. Adi Utarini. Uh, would you please um, elaborate more about this question? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, would it be implemented in, in other areas, areas in, Indonesia. Um, in Indonesia? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, what, what I can only mention was that um, uh, I think the Ministry of Health has uh, already stated their commitments that uh, efforts will be made to implement this in uh, five other cities in, in Indonesia. So, so far, I think at this stage, the commitment is there and this will be led by the Ministry of Health. And well, let's hope that uh, uh, we will be able to see, to see uh, the implementation in other, other cities in Indonesia. Yes, this is our hope too. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Adi. Um, next question, uh, I think it is also to, to you, Prof. Ari, uh, why the Wolbachia injected Aedes aegypti that released in Yogyakarta is only from egg, but in the Brazil, Colombia, New Caledonia, Australia are adult and egg. Is there any differences on the result of Wolbachia release in those areas? Um, yeah, um, maybe 
also yeah, the next yeah. question is that what are the big challenges or obstacles for the Wolbachia release in Yogyakarta from the first phase until now? I think the second question will be uh, for you, uh, Prof. Adi Tarini. Uh, Ari, would you please answer the question number one? And also Katie. Yes, also Katie. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, the question is uh, why in Yogyakarta city uh, release only egg, but not um, in other countries? Sorry, are you? That's for <laughs> Professor Adi or Professor Ari? Sorry, I'm getting confused. <laughs> yeah. It's you, Ari. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, it's, a, it's a great name, right? I mean, Ari, Ari, very close. Um, yes, right. <laughs> agree. <laughs> so I think you know. I mean, I mean another cut. Like, I think it comes down. I think we sort of partly answer that, right? And I think Prof. Adi and 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 um, Prof. Katie also answered that to some extent, right? Because we're looking at a situation where it's culturally dependent, and um, and of course, you know, the egg is a great example of a system where you can produce a lot. It's very easy from a production point of view. And you can just stick them. The container and you can take it out, that's really great. Mm. But the problem is that, you know, as Katie indicated, that you know the container can go rancid, as we say, right? It can get too hot, you get too much bacteria in there, that can actually kill a lot of the larvae as they emerge. And that can be a problem. You can have a little spider that fills the holes with a net, and that of course can also be a problem. So the recovery rate is a bit lower from a container than from an adult release. And there are also cultural reasons, right? I mean, basically, you know, if I was releasing in some countries and put a container out, I would lose about half of my containers that I put out. And that actually happened in Malaysia in one place that we did them in. And, um, you know, we ended up having to hide the traps with the eggs quite um, substantially to get an effect. And, and of course, you can get a slower increase in back here from egg releases than adult releases because you don't get the instant incompatibility when you release males. They make it the females, they produce the incompatibility. So the effect is much quicker than what you see with eggs quite often. The increase tends to be low. So I think it's I think it's very much a case of saying, look, you know, whatever's appropriate for the environment use, um, but um, think about both options as being perfectly viable. And, and as I said, in the future, with drone releases happening in large areas, you can imagine that adults are going to become probably the standard way of doing releases. Okay, Kathy, do you have any comment about this? No, I think, you know, what I mentioned before and what Ari's covered now really sums it up. There's not one right way to do it. Um, I think they're, they're both viable options and they're context dependent. I think for scale, you know, I think egg releases, um, Indonesia is sort of the poster child of how egg releases have worked really well, really consistently and now across really large areas. But in lots of other settings, we're finding that egg releases work really well at small scale, but are challenging to scale across really big, large, complex urban environments. So that's where adults might be um, the preferred option. Thank you for addition uh, information. Um, so Ibu Uud, so I will call you Ibu Uud because, it, because Ari and Adi is a bit confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly twin. <laughs> yes, yeah, but the, the second question uh, from these attendees, um, what are the big challenges or obstacles for the old backyard release in Yogyakarta? Uh, until yeah. Now? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in, 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 in each phase uh, has uh, unique challenges, yeah, unique um, obstacle challenges. But, but I think uh, to, to summarize, uh, there are technical and non-technical uh, obstacles. The, the non-technical part is uh, because in, in all the releases that we did, we always make sure that the community uh, accepts this technology, they understand how it works, and then uh, we have some sort of uh, mechanisms to make sure that the community approval is there. Um, and then secondly is also the stakeholders' uh, approval because I, I think this was a context of the research so that both community and the stakeholders, they have to, they have to agree and support uh, this intervention. 
Now, only after that has been uh, um, approved, then we 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 are confident uh, to do the the release. So um, I think what we learned was that uh, we need to engage early with the community and the stakeholder far before we actually do the release uh, activities. However, I think as, as it now it moves into uh, more of a, a government-led uh, intervention. So maybe when the government put their face <laughs> into this intervention, uh, the community and the stakeholder uh, acceptance may not be as, as uh, challenging uh, um, as when we did it uh, in the area. And then I think moving moving forward, uh, we need to think about the the technical part. I mean, having said that, the Ministry of Health is uh, or intend to uh, do this in in five uh, cities. Then certain issues have to be uh, discussed in depth in terms of uh, how will the production be ensured. Um, and then who will be supporting and giving technical assistance in the local implementation at the city level. Because what we experience in Sleman and Bantol, for example, even though this is already led by the district health office, but it, it requires still uh, some uh, level of, of uh, great support uh, 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 from whoever is implementing this, this project. So, Technical assistance in the field, uh, quality assurance, these, these are also things that have to be built when we uh, want to scale up in other activities. And then certainly funding. Yeah? <laughs> funding is always an, yeah. an issue, whether it's from the uh, philanthropies or combined of national and local uh, government funding from different sources. I think uh, this is also some key issues to move forward. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I think uh, we, all, we will have another session in the afternoon talking about the community engagement. Um, you will have uh, more insight uh, information from that session. I think we, we had a last question um, and this is for again uh, Prof. Ari Hoffman. Um, will Bakia success to apply in medical sector? Uh, it is possible to apply will Bakia in other sector, such as to apply yes. as an incompatible insect technique in agriculture. And what is the challenge? And the answer is absolutely yes. And it's not just the incompatible insect technique. Um, I'll just say like. I can't share my screen, unfortunately, but we published a paper with Chinese researchers back in 2020. It's called Gong et al. It's in a journal called Current Biology. It's a good journal. It's very, and it outlines how we've actually stopped the transmission of a plant virus in rice. And it's a plant virus that's also really problematic in Indonesia. And what we've done is taken Wolbachia, well, put it into a transmission agent, which is a plant hopper. And that plant hopper no longer can transmit that particular plant virus from one rice plant to the next rice plant. And it's again, it's a self spreading mechanism. It's like, you know, it's like what we've been talking about today. And so you start releasing it at a low frequency. And basically, in agricultural context, you can spread this thing potentially. Um, although, of course, field studies have not been done yet. So we have to get the approval first. So I think it has huge potential in any particular um, insect vector of plant viruses, we can use this technique very, very easily, I think. And I forget it also that, you know, there are a range of anosomiums that cause um, incompatibility. It's not just Wolbachia, there's also Cardinia and other things. And there is certainly a lot of interest in fruit flies, for instance, economic fruit flies, again, a problem in Indonesia, um, where we can use the Wolbachia to generate lines that can um, be released for SIT. So that's also a big thing, I think. Um, but just more generally, and I'd, I'd make one more point, there's a whole lot of endosymbionts out there apart from Wolbachia that are also incredibly useful. And, um, you know, I think we're starting an, 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 a revolution here in terms of using endosymbionts for more sustainable pest control. And I think mosquitoes are the first one off the rack. I think we have a long way to go, but I think it's a really exciting area into the future 
or we can really do these things. And, and as Professor Adi emphasized, we can decrease the input from a broad spectrum of chemicals, which of course are incredibly harmful to the environments. And um, ones that Katie didn't include are in economic analysis, but I mean, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to really decrease the amount of pesticide that's going on in the environment, which of course, indirectly is again, very harmful to humans and also to other animals. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, I will not conclude uh, all of discussion in this uh, session. Uh, we are uh, already have the very wonderful information and the dissemination of um, knowledge about uh, old Bakia technology. Thank you so much for all speakers, Prof. Ari Hoffman, Dr. Catherine, and also Prof. Adi Utarini. Um, I think that is all for this session. Thank you. Uh, have a good day. Uh, back to you, uh, Baeta. Thank you.